Hi, this is Dr. MJ coming to you from beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. This is the Women in Dentistry podcast where we feature women in dentistry making waves and leading the industry through the next decade. I am your host, Dr. Mary Jane Hanlon, a former dental assistant, dental hygienist, and now dentist. I'm very pleased to introduce you today to Dr. Gabriella LaGreca. Dr. LaGreca is a passionate dentist and assistant professor at Tufts University School of Dental Medicine in Boston, Mass., in the postgraduate prosthodontics department. Originally from Caracas, Venezuela, her passion for both science and, and arts drove her to become a dentist, receiving her dental degree from the University of Central Venezuela. After one year of private practice, she decided to pursue her dream in prosthodontics and moved to Boston to attend Tufts where she was a fellow in the implant training program and later completed her three-year residency program in prosthodontics. After graduating with high honors, Dr. LaGreca became one of fewer than 50 board certified prosthodontists in Massachusetts and a fellow of the American College of Prosthodontists. Her passion for education and mentorship will continue to inspire her professional development. In her free time, she can be found running doing yoga, or recording editing episodes of her most recent endeavor, the International Dentist Podcast, where she holds weekly interviews with dentists whom, like her, once had a dream of dentistry outside their home countries. It is now my pleasure to bring you to my interview with Dr. Gabriella LaGreca. I am so excited to have you with us, Gabriella. I can't wait to chat with you about what you're doing and all the great things that you have been doing in your career. So without any further ado, if you could just share your story, how you got into dentistry and what you're doing today, and then we'll get into some questions. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to our channel. And also don't forget to hit the bell so you never miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to share a little bit of my story with you, with your audience, and hopefully inspire other women in dentistry to pursue their careers. And a little bit about me. I'm actually originally from Venezuela. I got into dentistry through my orthodontist. I, in Venezuela, uh, dentistry, it's quite different than here. We actually have uh, the largest population of dentists are females. And the ratio is probably 80% women, 20% men. And it has been historically like that. So I was very familiar with female dentists since forever. My mom's dentist was female. I actually never met a male dentist until I was in dental school. Oh, my goodness. Really? Now, why do you think that is? You know, I think that originally the dental school is quite not new, but the dental school is probably about 80 years old. Actually, my dental school just turned 80 years old this year. And during the first 30 years, we were part of the medical school. So it seems like you, after doing like two years of basics, you will choose dentistry or medicine. And it seems like most male will go through medicine and then the female will go through dentistry. I don't know if it was a thing, but... I basically went to a dental school with a female dean. Then later she became the president of the university. So it was very common ground for us to have female in, in dentistry. And which was a, a cultural shock when I came to the U.S., but I'll talk a little bit about later. But then basically my orthodontist was a female. I had no dentist in my family, nobody related with the health business at all. No doctors, nothing. My dad is an engineer. My mom is a designer. So I grew up, I grew up in this house being my dad organized, everything has to be perfect and match aligned together. My mom making them pretty. So you could imagine like how the situation was like arranging furniture was like a thing every weekend or so because my mom will get bored and my dad will be, this is not functional. So anyway, I started seeing this orthodontist. I loved her practice. I love the way how she connected with people, the relationship she had with her assistant. I don't know. I just felt like it was a very nice environment. And I became so curious about it. I started to explore the options of becoming a dentist, not really knowing what it was about. And you actually apply for dental school right after your high school. We don't have college and our dental school is five or six years, depending on the school. So I did my application process right after high school. I remember my parents asking me, are you sure you want to do that? Like there's nobody in the family. It will be a lot easier for you to do something related to what your family does. 
And indeed, my sister is a designer and my brother is an engineer. So they both followed my mom and my dad paths. I chose something completely different. I always have done that, I think. I'm the oldest of three. I feel like I, I'm always trying to break the mold a little bit. I actually don't believe there is such a thing as a mold. I feel like it's very important to just listen to your gut. And I think I did that with dentistry. I applied to dental school, I got accepted, and I remember actually, even before dental school, behaving like if I was a dental student. And that was something that I think to me has always played in my life for good without me even noticing. Now that I look back, all of the times that I pretended to be or act like are things that became true. I don't know if it was visualizing or if it was actually like calling energy into that, of course, which was, I was completely unaware of. But I remember in, before dental school, I'll go to the dental school building just to see people. And I remember they always carry all of the, like the lab stuff. They will have them in a, in a little uh, bag. And I just remember basically following them. Oh, I see the ones with the bag. I know that they're going to sit to do wax up somewhere. So I'll like try to like almost spy what they were doing, going to even trying to sneak into some lectures. Uh, so I kind of became part of the system before I was even in the system. And I did the same thing later. Like I remember graduating in my school was a little bit challenging because until you complete your requirements, you're not able to fully graduate. Same as here, but with the limitations of if your patient, if any issue with your patient, you have to start the cases over. And we didn't go requirements like individual requirements or requirements for patients, completions. So it was kind of challenging sometimes if your patient disappeared, which actually happened to me later in my actually almost fifth year, one of my patients disappeared, was an RPD patient, so I had to start over like four months before graduation. So I almost didn't graduate with my class for that reason. But I remember I will walk from the parking lot through my dental school building and I will, I will feel I was wearing the cap and gown. I will visualize me wearing the cap and gown because in those same halls, I will be basically walking when I graduated. So that's just to bring you back the... Uh, the, the fact that I feel like it's very important to visualize. And I tell my students, I tell my residents all the time, just picture it. Have that picture in your face. Be able to look at yourself in the mirror and have that reflection so clear. Then, then it just becomes true. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, I get chills. Like I still cannot describe how is that possible, but it happens. It happens to me so many times. So I'm actually really thrilled that you brought that up. And I'm going to table this until later on in our discussion but that's how I have lived my life too. And it is something that I don't think most people understand, but once you do and you understand how impactful it can be, it is absolutely amazing what you can accomplish. So I want to table it for now, but kudos to you for understanding that. It is one of God's greatest gifts, I think. It is. It is. And I think once you become aware of it, you cannot be indifferent. Like once you see it and once you see it happening, you just cannot unseen, right? So it almost becomes this thing of let me really make sure I make my dreams come true because if I don't, it really depends on me. Exactly. It's also a responsibility too. Well, anyway, I ended up uh, doing my dental education in Venezuela and fast forward to now, after graduating, uh, I started working and I worked for about a year. And after a year or so, I kind of became bored very quickly, not from the practice of dentistry, just from the fact that I was not learning. And I guess that learning is a big part of my life. My parents, although they have different professions, they both dedicated to education. My dad always worked in a, a school. My mom had a school herself. So I was very familiarized with the learning type of lifestyle. And I was doing a lot of courses. I was doing a lot of things, but I just did not feel confident that I could practice that dentistry that I wanted to practice, that I could provide that to my patients. I didn't feel like I had the skills built neither the knowledge at that level. And of course, confidence was a thing at that time. So I ended up a, um, following my dad's a, advice to say like, he almost forced me into coming to the United States to study English initially. I was ready to apply. Actually, I applied for a postgraduate program in prosthodontics, which later became my specialty. But I applied first in Spain. And I was ready in Spain. I was accepted. I was ready to start uh, the program the following summer. And this was January of 2011, actually December of 2010. 
my dad convinced me to come to the U.S. for a few months so I could improve my English, which eventually will help me to read literature and then in, in my program in general in Spain. So I saw that as an opportunity. Okay, something short, I can do it. Let's go. And the, that three month period became a 10 year story. Wow. I never went back. I did not do my program in Spain. I ended up applying here. I was accepted in this country and I got rid of Tufts. So I did the two trainings. I started observing and going back to the visualization. I started observing at Tufts at that time, the implant center. And I would just come in the morning. I switched all of my English classes so I could come here like a resident. So I was coming 7 a.m. with oral surgery residents. And I was leaving at 5 p.m. And I was going nighttime to go my, to my English classes. And I was observing for probably three or four months. All the course of my supposed to be English training. And at the end, when I was ready to leave, and this is unbelievable, but I guess it was meant to be. And when people ask me why I chose Boston, I didn't choose Boston. Boston chose me. Tufts chose me. And for that, I feel honored, grateful, and I feel it's a dream come true. I became part of this family in 2011, and I did my implant training. I was offered a position as a fellow, and later on the following year, I applied for PROS, and I became a PROS resident. I had no idea. And so now, are you, are you at the school full-time, or are you working outside? I am the school full time. I see patients in the faculty practice. I've been doing that since I graduated. I finished PROS in 2015. So actually, I was talking to a friend this morning. This week became, I, it's been five years that I've been teaching at Tufts. That's incredible. So are you planning on doing the IS program or the faculty program? Yes. Excellent. Because I know that our faculty practice is in the process of closing. And so if you want to work outside, you're going to have to get a license, obviously, in, in the United States. So I'm, I'm so excited to hear that you say that you're going to do that because that's a great. I think that's one of the, the nicest benefits that Tufts offers their international faculty is the opportunity to get a license while they're teaching. Absolutely. That's a, a gift. It's, it's a wonderful thing and it's something to like, if possible, to try to maximize. I guess I didn't think about it before because I, I like teaching a lot and I feel teaching is always going to be a big part of my career. And I focus so much on one thing and that's something that sometimes brings me a lot of positive things, but I, I notice sometimes pulls me away from things. So I left that aside for a while. And now with the closure of the faculty practice, I decided to get back into like, my boards and apply for the program, hopefully to start next year. Excellent, excellent. So are you only teaching at the postgraduate level or do you teach at the undergraduate level as well? At this point, I'm only teaching in postgraduate. Uh, when I started, my position was, my appointment was pre-doctoral teaching. I did that for about a year. It was a great year and I could not regret, like I don't regret a thing. I actually started very early, even directing a course. So I was course director pretty much in the second month that I started working. I started to be engaged into more activities because it's just part of who I am as a person. I like to get involved. And shortly after, I will say probably eight months or so, my program director in PROS approached me, the chair approached me. They wanted me to, they offered me a full-time position in postgraduate, which to me was an honor at that time. To be honest, I, I still miss teaching the doctoral clinic, but I found other ways to stay connected with them ways that I could still be impactful, that I could still be linked and help. And I've done that. I think I, try, I managed to, to still be involved. Most of my teaching commitments are with the, with the residents. Excellent. Excellent. So do you, your parents must miss you terribly. It breaks my heart. <laughs> I'm very close to my parents, especially both my mom and my dad. My, my dad is my best friend. So whenever I think about who inspired me in life, who pushed me to do things, who always believed in me, it's always been my dad. Like when I decided to, that I will stay here, I remember I got offered a position for the fellowship and I walk up, I remember they asked me like, but yes or no? I'm like, yes, don't you want to talk to your parents? I'm like, yes, but I'm sure it will be yes because I know my dad. So I call him, he started crying and then he said, okay, great, let's just get to it. Like every time my dad's attitude towards life has been 
even if we don't know how, don't worry about it. I will make it happen. Don't even worry about it. I will make it happen. So that stick on me very much. And I remember at the beginning, it was a struggle. Financially, it was a struggle for us big time because I took my parents' retirement to study. All of their life savings. But, and it, it still haunts me a little bit. I try. I remember I gave my first paycheck to my parents. As soon as I could, I, I made a trip to Orlando. We went to Disney together. I'm very lucky. I consider myself one of the luckiest persons in the world because I have parents that always believe in me. No matter what, no matter what I want to do, crazy, uh, simple, whatever it is, they always have an advice. Of course, they always have an opinion. They make sure I know their opinion. <laughs> that opinion like follows that. Okay, but at the end, I will, I, will, I will support you. I will support you if you think that's the right thing to do. So I think that actually gave me it gave me a lot of confidence from a very young age to do things, to be a little bit risky, riskier than my friends, I say. I was the only one in my family living in the country. The first one, actually, out of all my cousins, out of everyone I knew, I was the first one challenging the status quo of doing something different. In a country where I had no friends, no family, I knew nobody, uh, just because I wanted to learn. That was my first uh, motivation. So I'm very lucky. It's amazing what our parents and how they can set us up for the rest of our life just by small, simple actions that they take that are unselfish. And, you know, I think, and I don't know if you're a parent or not, but I know to this day that if my daughter needed anything, I'd lay over and die for her. And I think all of us as parents think that way because what else do you have? You know, if you can't do for your children, there's, there's nothing so enjoyable in life than making sure that your children are okay. And so I can understand their commitment to you and I can understand their commitment to wanting to ensure that you had everything you needed in order to get from point A in your journey to the end of your journey. So congratulations. That's wonderful to hear such a great, inspiring story. I don't have children on my own yet, but I always think about that. And I always tell the residents and my residents, I don't have children, but I have 16 of you just like running around. And like, <laughs> so it's as, as close as it gets to me yet. And so I have 16 adults, but I feel that that love that parents feel for the children is definitely something that nothing can measure. So uh, mm -hmm. it excites me thinking about the opportunity to be a parent just to be able to give to that level. I always found or felt that I am a giver by nature. And I feel that that's my mission. My mission has always been, and it's been very clear since a very young age. If I'm not giving, if I'm not sharing, I don't have happiness. I could be doing anything, but if I'm not sharing it with somebody or giving part of that to somebody, it dies there. So I'm sure when I have my children, I will be able to take this to another level. So, Well, I'll tell you, you will put pressure on yourself to even be better than your parents. So just, so just, just know that's coming because you'll think to yourself, well, my parents did this for me. I want to do that and more you know, because that's how we think, right? Where it's not a competitive thing. It's more of, you just want to give so much because you've got so much. I agree. I think that my dad was one of my biggest inspirations as well. And when you have someone like that behind you sharing your love for the journey that you're on, it spurs you on. Both my parents were wonderful, not just my dad, but I remember my dad was an educator. So um, he's since passed, both my parents have, but you know, he was in education. And I remember when I, I shared with him, he, his mind was going at the time that I became a dean. He said, Mary Jane, you're a dean? <laughs> because he understood that word. And it made him so proud. And there was nothing like that moment. I'll, I'll cherish that moment the rest of my life because it was just I knew he was happy and that's all that, you know, I couldn't give him money. I, you know, I didn't give him, you know, cause he didn't need it. You know, he, he didn't need it. Give it to your kids, you know, give it to your children, give it to somebody, but I don't need it. So what I could give him was something that would make him happy. So I think that anything we can give our parents is just love back and something that makes them smile and keeps them happy. So. 
Absolutely. And those things cannot be measured. They cannot be compared with anything. You gave him something that it was basically something that will speak his language. Exactly. So what do you think was the best piece of advice that you've ever had, either for your career or for your life? Was it from your parents or, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, but, you know, I'm just asking, was it your parents or was it somebody else or what was it? I will say that thinking on life perspective, my grandfather, my dad's dad, um, he's Italian. He's still alive. He's 96 years old. He lives in Italy. We're very lucky to have him. He always told me since I was very, very young, in his broken Italian Spanish, right? Piano, piano, si va lontano, which means step by step, you can get far. And we'll have this conversation all the time because at the beginning, you know, I'm five years old. I don't understand what piano, piano, si va lontano means stuff like just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But then over time, I learned from his story uh, as an immigrant that left Italy and went to Venezuela with a family and everything that. What that really meant is that the biggest things in life are built out of small decisions. And it's the the little things. And you can imagine, like, it's just that one decision that can completely shift your path. So many times we worry about the big things and it's completely meaningless. The the beauty, the changes, the transformation happens in, in everyday small things. But we're impatient. And I have a very impatient nature that I've been trying to obligate over the years. And I've been working on it, I think, I hope. Uh, but I always try to remember that almost uh, as a mantra, along with uh, other things. And I think that's probably something that followed me in my whole life. If I think in something newer, when I was an adult, my program director at the time that I was doing profs told me something that stick with me. He called me in the office one day and I'm like, he's going to yell at me. And I don't know what I did. He was like, you know what, I think you're, he he was uh, Japanese, very difficult to say nice words about people. So I'm like, there he is trying to like compliment me in a very weird way. So I couldn't understand what he was trying to say. But overall, he said, you have uh, good qualities. You show people confidence, but that's something that it will affect you because that makes people believe that you don't need help. So you need to make sure you ask for help because people will never come to rescue even when you need it the most because they won't know you need to be rescued. That thing, MJ, I remember now every time, and this was my first year of residency, at the moment I'm like, what are you even talking about? I feel like looking confidence is a good thing. Like, oh, you have to show that you know, you have to show independence and all those things are good attributes. But I guess that when that gets out of balance and you don't even know when is the right moment to ask help, you even feel that it's bad or that showing that vulnerability has a negative connotation, then you are defeating the purpose. Right. That's actually a great observation by him because I think that many times when we do see a confident student or a confident young dentist, we will bypass them because we suspect that they don't need our help, right? But we don't ask. And so that's a really, really good observation on his part that he observed that you're extremely confident, but was thoughtful enough to tell you, you have to ask for help. Yeah, and I try to remember that as a teacher, as an educator, I used to observe more the ones that you think that need help, the ones that obviously need help and you allocate more time, more attention. I make an extra effort to reach out to those that seem like they're doing okay, that they have it all under control. Even if at the end the answer is, yes, I'm fine, Dr. LaGreca, don't worry about me, great. But I make sure I work, I strongly believe on relationships. I think this is, uh, we live in a world that it's built on our relationships with each other. So I make sure it's, it's so important to me as an educator to make sure my residents know they can reach out to me anytime for anything they need. And that could be something related with prosthodontics or it could be something related with their health of their parents or whatever situation. So I feel that I want to be that person. I want to be that uh, faculty that takes it that's, I guess, above and beyond to really uh, show them how much I care. I always tell them I'm not 
the best faculty. I'm sure I'm not the best prosthodontist, but I can promise them I care the most. I feel that we live in a world where people are very selfish, self-centered, which is sad, but I make an extra effort to overcompensate for that, for others, for the system, and give whenever possible. Absolutely. That's awesome. Who do you think professionally has made the biggest impact on your career? I have like a constellation of mentors, depending on the aspects of my life and the moments of my life. Professionally, before coming to this country, I had three faculties, all female faculties, Dr. Carmen Batista, uh, Sandra Briseño, and Dr. Patricia Castro, that they were very influential to me, even, even into getting into prosthodontics or later on to in getting involved into organizational dentistry at some point. They were key players in to inspire me back home. When I came here, I feel like my program director, Dr. Hiroshi Hirayama, was highly influential to me. I, the first of all, it was my first experience here in the country. It was, I guess, everything I could ever ask for a mentor. In his way, it, he really molded a lot of things of me as an educator and inspired me in many ways, as well as uh, Dr. Kiho Kang, who was my first boss. I guess all the time my parents, because my, my dad was my first boss actually back home in their business, but my first real boss. And these were people that are deeply passionate about what they do. And I think they share that in common. And I feel very uh, magnetized when people are passionate about what they do, whether it's dentistry or it's something else. And uh, an advice I give to my students always, and I learned that from uh, a prosthodontist, this Dr. Suhei Morgan. She teaches at Tufts too. And she has a beautiful family. She has three kids. Ever since I was a resident, she will be the one mentoring me on, okay, it's okay to be good in dentistry. Dentistry has a lot to offer, but you also have to find balance in life. Yeah. I want to see you being happy. I want to see you doing the things you like. She will always remind me still until today that I'm happy to call her a friend. If she sees me like I'm going all crazy with 200 projects and like as usual having a schedule longer than the, the hours available she would like call me are you sure you're getting your runs in are you sure you're doing your yoga like <laughs> make sure you find some time for yourself because around my passions I tend to I guess leave everything behind even the things that I really know are important for me just because I get so passionate about so there's been a lot of people a lot of people even now I think we have great people at Tufts that we are we work with that are highly inspirational from my perspective at least somewhat somebody that graduated with me the same year and now is doing a lot of wonderful things with academic careers is Dr. Dragon so we work together we share we have cases together then I have you being handled like how can like how not to be inspired when you have strong leaders that are taking the extra step to do something they don't need to do. You're doing this because you want to really make a difference. You want to offer something different from your perspective with the access you have to people that could be so powerful for others. You're taking the extra step and doing something for the profession, something for our students. Those things to me, I need to do something. When I feel that passion, I feel like it's almost a call and a duty to do something. Well, that, that's a great segue into asking the question. So tell us a little bit about your exciting new program and what you're planning on doing. Because I'm like so excited that it inspired you. So I'm so excited that you told me about it today. Yeah, no, I know. I want, I want everybody to know that as soon as during quarantine, I had this idea. And this was, I guess, we were all trying to look for things to do. And I did a couple of Instagram lives and things like that. And I felt a need of connecting to others, right? So, and I will go on runs. Like I, I'm an avid runner, so I'll go on my runs. And that's actually my moment of getting ideas. I get so many rush ideas. I have to leave the pencil and the paper right next to the entrance table of the house. Because as soon as I come back, I need to write down all of the things that I come to my head when I'm running. So... One of them was to do a podcast and I navigate through all the ideas. And then, of course, I walk away from it. It's like, oh, it's too scary. It's too this, too that. And then I remember the dragon telling me, you know, uh, Dean Hanlon is going to have a podcast of women in dentistry. I'm like, oh, my God. 
you became my idol right away. I felt so compelled to like, and I think I told you when I, when I emailed you that that really meant so much. It almost felt like that divine call that I was waiting for. And I had already looked into equipments, but I didn't feel, I guess I didn't want to invest on myself. Is that part of confidence into something new that I'm like, I'm not going to spend all this money on equipment and courses. Next thing I know, boxes come in and my partner who supports all my, my dreams and everything, he bought all the equipment. He signed me up in a course and I, here I am mid quarantine, just planning this crazy dream and now doing interviews and all that. So it's been really exciting. And the goal of my podcast is going to be the International Dentist Podcast. And I will be interviewing, I am interviewing international dentists in their career paths in this country. So it's been fun. That's number one. Besides fun, it's been really powerful. The things that I learned about people, like so far, of course, I'm interviewing people I know. And that was really life-changing as soon as I started reaching out to people. And of course, I was a little bit scared at first. I just said, you know what? I'm going to send my invitations because I've been thinking about this too long. If I keep waiting until I'm ready, I'm never going to be ready, like always. Now, I push myself down the cliff. Step by step, right? Like that. I'm like, okay, I think I prepared enough. If this is not prepared enough, I don't know what it is. So I remember I sent like 12 emails from the people that I have listed already on my roster that I would like for my season one. And next thing you know, I go to bed. I'm ascending and going to bed. I'm waking up in the morning and already half people have replied that they would love to participate, that they cheer my project and this is so valuable, etc. That gave me energy. And I think that always helps me with, when talking about confidence. I wasn't always confident, definitely not. But it's these little things that I think it, it helped you develop in that. So it's been fun. I hope that I can make a change in the world. I could really help others like I've been helped and hopefully I can inspire them in their journey and be there for them. Excellent. I'm so excited. So we'll put the link to your podcast on the website when we get it up and running and, and your podcast gets posted so that people can absolutely go and, and start listening to you as well. Are you focusing on female or both male and female? Male and female, both. The target for, for season one is people that actually did their dental education in Venezuela. Uh, sorry, in different countries. Like I started with a few Venezuelans. So I'm trying to get people from all over. So season one, I have actually people from almost every continent, which has been really interesting. So I'm collecting a lot of different experiences from people that went through academia to others that went into practice, business owner, so a little bit of everything, but just showing different career paths for international dentists has been, has been fun. Excellent, excellent. So interesting that you shared the quote from your grandfather, step by step, and I know that we will both understand this. You know, when you, when you do something new like this, it is frightening, but you do just have to take the first step because you do figure it out, right? And, you know, and I feel so bad too, when I reflect back, I remember doing my first couple of podcasts and I kept thinking, oh my God, these are horrible. I'm never gonna be good at this, right? <laughs> and then, I, you know, of course, Christina Paston was, was a great trooper and she was the first one that I did. And, you know, we both chuckle about it and say, it's okay, it's, it, it wasn't perfect, but it was a start, right? And she was starting to want to get online. So it, was, it worked out really well for both of us. And I will say that, you know, as time has gone on, it becomes easier and easier, right? Because you just get excited to just have another conversation with, well, for me, it's another girlfriend, right? I'm just having another conversation with somebody who adores dentistry as much as I do. So kudos and congratulations. I couldn't be more excited for you. I'm, I'm so excited. I can't wait to hear it. Thank you. And thank you for your inspiration. I really, You know, as little as I know, you know, I think that ripple effect is so important for people to understand. You never know the people that you impact. And I have to say that I was so touched when I got your email, you know, that you were excited about this and, you know, excited, really sincerely excited. And, and um, that really touched my heart. So thank you for taking the time to send the email. It really helped me. It really did. 
So what obstacles in your lifetime have you had to overcome to get you to where you are? Have there been any, anything big that has happened to you that, you know, that you want to share any inspiration on how you got by that? I think the worst advice is, and I, we always talk about the good advice that we hear, but we very little stop to think about what is a really bad advice. And there's a lot of bad advice out there. And having the intelligence, the emotional intelligence to distinguish what is a really good advice for me and what is a advice the other one is giving for themselves more than for you. So may, during the process of my planning on coming here, at some point I decided not to share that with anyone. I kept it for myself because, I mean, I almost felt like I was hiding it from people because at the, at the beginning I talked to some people about it. And I heard over and over, this is too difficult, that you're not going to be able to do this, that you don't have the money, you don't have the intelligence, you're not smart enough, you're not this, you're not that. And I said, you know what, I'm going to still try. I don't care. I need to be able to see myself in the mirror every day. And if I don't do this, I won't be able to. So I really gave it, like, I, for most things, I think about it a lot. But this is one of the things that I just did without really overthinking and I feel now that if if I would have known what I know now I will be so much care what I was I will be like terrified from everything that I have ahead so I had a lot of people give me hard times with my dreams because they felt they were too big for themselves not for me which I, th I think is something that I heard in your podcast many women correlate to that with other like males not thinking that they were capable enough smart enough you mentioned that many times so I feel that that's the first barrier other things that I struggle with and I learned to be okay with was the fact that I have to embrace that I'm a strong woman and for many years I felt guilty about it I felt that I had to tone myself or I had to Oh, I'm intimidating others. And people will tell me, oh, you are too intimidating. Like, you have to be nicer or you have to be. And like, I feel like I'm nice enough. If you get intimidated by me, that talks about you, not about me. That's right. So learning how to deal with that and understanding that I'm not going to be the best for everyone. I'm not going to like everyone. Not everybody's going to like me. And that's okay. Accepting that and letting people go out of my life when they just cannot vibrate in the same frequency that I do. And that could be a partner, that could be a family member, that could be a boss, that could be a coworker. So accepting that and, and be okay with that helped me love myself more because I felt like I was being present for myself more versus being always present for the other, which is something I feel like is part of my nature. So I need to be okay for me first before being okay for others and in order to be able to provide for, for others. I always tell my students, and it's actually the final quote of my podcast because I was thinking what could be a phrase that I say all the time that is impactful. And I always tell my students, I'm always here for you. And I mean it. And I start thinking, am I always here for myself? So I try. I try to not let any obstacle pushing me away from my goals. I try to think that many times people act because of things that are happening in their life. So I try to have compassion, try to have an emotional intelligence on when things are about me and when not, but I need to be myself. And if be myself means be a strong woman that can do a lot of things that others feel scared about, that's fine. That's who I am. You know, it takes a very emotionally intelligent human to understand that observation. And so kudos to you because not many, it took me a long time to understand that basic principle. I didn't understand until I was much older. Wish I had understood it when I was younger. I just never listened to anybody because I was on a mission. I knew exactly what I wanted to do at a very young age. And I wasn't letting anybody tell me what I can and cannot do. I don't know if it was stubbornness. I have no idea what it was. But if I had listened to anybody or listened to all the people that said I was never going to be able to do this, never be able to become a dentist, never be able to do anything, 
I wouldn't have gotten out of my hometown. So, you know, that was something that was not an option for me. It was, I was going to dental school. I didn't know how, I didn't know when, I was just going to go. So I think that you're absolutely right. What people say is more of a reflection of themselves, not of you. And what they say, even though they're saying it to help protect you, they're saying it because that's how they really feel about themselves, that they could never do it. So great emotional intelligence on your behalf to understand that right away. It's been a journey, like everything. It takes little steps, different experiences, but the more I live life with that, through those glasses, the simpler it gets. It's like a practice of, of yoga or like running. First few times, first few months, it's going to be difficult. But at some point, it just becomes second nature. So, Having been a runner for a while, I, I totally get that. <laughs> Once you get into that and, you know, the runner's high that you get doesn't come all the time. But man, oh man, when you get it, gosh, there's no better feeling. And just being in that flow, you just understand. And I, I can actually do that when I'm working at times. And you get into that flow and you can't hear a, a single thing happening around you. You just keep going. And it's the most amazing feeling in the world and the most, the time when you accomplish the most, I think. Absolutely. It, in work, I, I felt that so many times. And I have those moments, I don't know, because I'm seeing a patient or because I'm like teaching something to a student in the clinic that I'm not only disconnected from the war and like so present in the moment that it really takes your, your mind, your skills to, to another level. Like you said, it doesn't happen all the time, but I feel like, and, and I link that to your question on the aha moments. Uh, I remember like thinking what an aha moment for me in dentistry and in life, like I feel that most of my aha moments come from situations like that, on which I feel like all of the dots, all of the stars, everything possible connected that day for me to be doing that thing that I'm doing. It's just, it feels like a dream. I often have this uh, sensation when I'm practicing either with patients or, or in the clinic that I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. That I, like, if you believe in God or whatever, like master power you believe on, that person designed me for this very moment, that feeling, it's indescribable. It is, it is indescribable. So let's go back to, you know, your younger days and your younger years. Did you feel like your parents brought you up to be a confident young woman right away? Or do you feel like you had to gain your confidence as time went on? Because I know that's a challenge for most of our female students. And Obviously, one of the reasons why I started this podcast is to, you know, showcase women that may or may not have been confident in their early years and just show them that what can be accomplished. I definitely, by nature, I'm not a very confident person. Now, that surprises me. Yeah, like I actually go by people think that I'm super confident just because I was born that way. And the same way they think I'm an extrovert because I talk a lot. But I feel my nature is very quiet, very introvert, very on my own thing. And I felt that carry on a lot in my young ages. I was the, the oldest child of three. So I had a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. My parents always raised me up to be an example for my brother and sister. So I grew up with them telling me, oh, if you do that, your brother and sister will do it. So always have to think I'm doing the best the most correct, the perfect, so they can have the, an example to follow, which at the end they did whatever they want, right? Because it always goes that way. But I'm like, I'm doing this and they're doing whatever. But I felt that that put a lot of pressure on me. And even now as an adult, I had that conversation with my parents many times, especially with my dad. He was really strong about that. That actually put, set me back for, for a go slower in life. I feel that I was always slower than my friends at everything. Like everything, I felt like it came to me later than for others. Success, opportunities. I always felt like I had to work extra hard for things to come my way. Um, from time to time, I used to complain about it. Like, oh, why so easy for that person? Or why so complicated for me? 
But part of that, actually, I hide it under my body. I had a lot of body conceptions and issues about acceptance of my body, even up to residency. After I finished residency, I went through a very deep transformation. I don't like calling it a weight loss journey because I think it was a life-changing journey, but I lost over 50 pounds in a year and a half. I started becoming that person that I knew, I knew lived inside of me, that for many years I just cover up with food and stuff and that they were not good for me. So all of these things, running, yoga, dreams about life, I definitely I had a lot of that inside in my heart, but I didn't let that go out that easily. But certain things helped me gain confidence. One was, of course, losing the weight, knowing that I was able to, that that was something that was completely on my control and responsibility. And we don't have that many things in life that we feel that we can control. So I felt like anything that I put in my mouth is my responsibility. Every mile I run, it's on me. Nobody will run it for me. So it felt, instead of feeling, that responsibility felt really empowering. I like, wow, I really can do this. And of course, you start losing weight, you start looking better, people are noticing, and then you start getting confidence. So I think in that same mindset, a lot of things came after whenever I feel scared about something, if I push myself to do it, even when I don't know anything about it, like most things, I have no clue when I'm jumping into them. It, then I feel like, okay, I can learn. I'm, I'm a learner, so I don't mind reading. I'm, I'm, I don't mind asking. So I ask a lot of questions without shame or fear of being judged by asking questions. But I don't, I don't stop or I don't double think too much about doing them. And same thing in, in my residency. Although I was perceived as a confident person, I had a lot of fears, a ridiculous amount of fears inside from the, the perspective of being an international student in a different environment. Now I'm treating American patients. Are they going to notice my ads and are they going to criticize me for that? to the point of my dental skills, through the point of my physical appearance. So I felt like I always had to compensate it because I was covered up with other stuff. So later when I completed residency, and this was, again, I think the, the, the point that I could remember that mark a clear line of before and after in my life in many ways, it was finishing residency, finishing a chapter that it was so difficult for me and my family from all perspectives, be far from my family for super long. Financially, it was a restriction, like I couldn't really do much and I didn't feel like doing much because I just couldn't afford it. And, and all of these things related to the point that, I mean, I didn't take any vacation, of course, over those four years because everything was around school. I didn't even get a haircut. Like, there were so many things that I was like, okay, now I'm done. I'm working. I have a salary. I could do things. So that freedom of earning my first paycheck of being able to now not needing to ask my parents to feel independent, that was um, very, very empowering. Then along with that, of course, started losing the weight. I did my board certification in prosthodontics, which I think professionally took me to another level. I didn't, I didn't imagine what that would do in a person. And if any residents are listening to this podcast, challenge your board exams. Do it. It's, you're going to feel, uh, I get the chills when I remember, you're going to feel some, I guess, the, the biggest sense of pride that you could ever feel is when you accomplish something like that. And I remember my interview with Dr. Hirayama for pros, and I remember he asked me, are you going to take the board exam? Because all of my Venezuelan residents, they never did. So are you going to be like them? And, it, and my thought process was, what is a board exam? <laughs> I'm going to say yes, because he looks really, really mad about this. So <laughs> I lie. I said, yes, of course. If that's important, I will do. And then I went home and I searched, what is a board exam? I knew about the national boards, but I had no idea in prosthodontics, what is he talking about? So... I think those very key moments in which you're able to demystify who you are, who you think you are, and you're actually showing the world and showing yourself who are you really in your heart? What are you made of? More than the self-talk of you can do this, you can do that. So in terms of confidence, if, if I could give a piece of advice to, to students and to women out there, it's not who you think you are, it's who you really are. Let it go out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be scary. You're going to have a lot of fears, and that's normal. We all 
have fears. Just don't let those fears stop you. That is unbelievable advice and spot on because it couldn't have been said better. You know, you have fear and you have to accept fear. It's part of our coping mechanism, but you have to do it anyway. And if you just take the first step, just one thing, and, and that's my mantra that I use every day, just one step today, that's all I have to take, just to get one step closer. So kudos, great advice. So you, at this point, depending upon the situation, feel extremely confident in your ability as a dentist, extremely confident in your ability to teach. Maybe a little bit rocky or starting to learn about the podcast situation, <laughs> much like me. So I think that that's, that's another great piece of advice to share with the audience is that, you know, anytime anything new comes about we, and we don't know anything about it, that, yeah, we're not going to feel confident until we do it. Absolutely. And I think we have to find those things constantly. We cannot let ourselves go in this spiral of comfort of everything is under control. I'm so fine about everything. Actually, I'm scared about that. Whenever I'm feeling it, I get itchy. I'm like, okay, no, I need something that makes me uncomfortable a little bit because something is not right. So that constant challenge, it's very important. It helps you build resilience, which to me is one of the biggest qualities that a person can have. I've been actively working on trying to become more resilient is being a thing for me. And I, you know, I always think about it like I don't break. I will bend. I will fall. I'll be squeezed, but you're not going to break me. Nothing will. So I need things that constantly squeeze me, push me, bend me, because I'm not going to do it on my own that well. I could take myself into uncomfortable situations often if I want to, but I need to, to really be challenged. And, and being challenged represents doing those things that scare you. It, it means not having everything under control. And it's a nice feeling of having control. I, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. Actually, it feels great. <laughs> it's fantastic. But it's not nice when everything is all under control. I feel like everybody in dentistry and in any career, you have to find a, a hobby, an activity, something outside of your profession that gives you life that you're passionate about and that could be something this year and then next year something different or for some people it's a life of a hobby into a particular thing they love do it do it because it's it's important it's important for your well-being for your emotional being for for others it's important as well because you could bring so much to your profession, to your career, if you learn from others' experiences outside of what we do. Like, imagine like this podcasting thing. Well, how many dentists are out there doing this? This has nothing to do with dentistry. But it's interesting. It's fun. It's, it's something that could bring a benefit. It's challenging, but it's there. So, and like that, many things. Like I applaud everyone's effort to do something that is out of the box to really try to challenge the status quo, to do something different to what people are advising you to do. <laughs> because of course, people would advise you the, the same thing or whatever works for them. And that's not where transformation happens. Right, right. And that's, that's the key right there. That's where the transformation happens. That's where the big stuff in life really starts to happen. And you see so many drastic changes. Every time I have pushed myself beyond my limits, and I talk a lot about this outside of the podcast mindset. There's a huge difference between a growth mindset and a fixed mindset, right? You know, growth mindset sees the world as open and possibilities, where a fixed mindset sees the world as, as closed and there's nothing else than what you see and what you get, right? And so, you know, living your life that way is you miss out on so many opportunities. And, you know, obviously I can tell from you that, you know, you have a growth mindset because you're challenging yourself every day, which is amazing. It's what keeps us growing. And, and, you know, you don't plant a seed in the ground to have it die. You plant a seed in the ground to see it grow, right? It's funny you mentioned that over the quarantine. And one of the, the crazy ideas I had when I was running was this thinking about the growth. And I became more a friend of having plants at home because I used to kill every plant. Like it was a disaster. 
And in this house that I'm right now, I have a lot of windows. I have a lot more space. So I decided to to give it a, another chance to to gardening. So now that I'm having a lot of plants at home and I've been successfully not killing any. Congratulations. Thank you. The learning of seeing a plant growing and how key it is for a plant to be in the right place where it receives exactly the amount of light it needs for that plant, which is not the same for other plant, that is in the right pot for that plant that is not the same for another, that actually you're fertilizing them in the right moments of the year and then you're watering just enough for what that plant's needs are. How is that connected to who we are as human beings? When we are in a place that we can grow, that we can thrive, that we receive the right amount of attention, the right amount of support, according to our particular needs, how much can we grow? Versus when we are in the corner, when in an environment that is not really setting us for success. So try to thrive for light. We are beings of light. I think we need to be in environments that allow us to grow and it's okay to accept when an environment is not healthy for you, when an environment is not letting you thrive, just switch it, change it, yeah. because you are a plant that is made to grow and have beautiful flowers. If you're not, it's because you're not in the right place. You're not in the right environment. That's correct. That's correct. So interesting that you should bring that up. I think, too, that, that one of the things that's critically important with thinking about growth is that, you know, love is also a, you know, an energy, right? And that our plants can actually grow by us mentally sending them love. And so if you think about that impact on another human being, and you don't physically have to hug them, you don't have to do anything, but sending somebody love in your thoughts and your mind and caring for that person can actually be like a fertilizer for that person and help improve their life. So I, I learned that early on with plants because, you know, I think back in high school, we did an experiment on, you know, vibrations with plants and, and sending them love. And they, they've done experiments and they grow so much bigger and so much better than if, if you don't. And so my partner and I do that with my orchids. I love orchids. And so we do that with the orchids. We talk to them every day. Hi, ladies. How are we this morning? You know, it's kind of a goofy thing, but you know, it works and, and gosh, they're growing and, and blooming like crazy. I'll have to send you some pictures. And in my office, I have four of them that are blooming like nuts right now. So you have to, you have to, they have names, right? Well, they don't have names. I haven't gone that far, but you know, I call them my ladies and you know, I talk to them every day. So it's kind of a funny thing, but you know what? I, I see it and they love the light that they get, you know, from the, the window and it just, it, you're absolutely right. If they're in the right environment with the right settings, there's no stopping what can be done and what can be accomplished. So I think you're absolutely right to correlate that with humans. Unbelievable. What would be one thing that people would be surprised to learn about you? I'm a yoga instructor. And that's something that many people don't know about. I did actually a yoga teacher certification. It was one of my to-do list after pros, right? So that was a, in my list. And that's something definitely tends to surprise people. And something that people get surprised often is about all of the other things I do outside the dentistry. And definitely I'm passionate about dentistry. I loved it, but I need fuel from other things too. I need creative outlets. I feel like, I don't know if in other lives I was an artist. I, if you believe in other lives, I strongly believe that there is something artistic in me that I channel through the industry, but when I'm not able to channel it through the industry for whatever reason, like now in quarantine, I need to find other outlets. So I'm a, a very creative and intuitive person. Something else that probably will surprise people <laughs> is that I have dreams. I'm the kind of person that have this, I don't know, revelation dreams, like of things, not necessarily things that are going to happen to me, but whenever I'm going through a hard time or I have to make a decision. I listen to my dreams a lot. And I don't know if it's because I'm connected with an intuitive part of me or my another part of my brain that I'm not listening that is talking to me on the dreams. But I tend to have very vivid dreams. 
Now, do you wake up and write them down? Because I know that that's something that we're supposed to do because we don't often remember them even seconds after we wake up. I normally don't remember them right away. I remember them after. So I have flashes of the dreams after. Now I learned their dreams. At the beginning, I used to think this is like, like a deja vu, like I don't know what it is. It feels like I was there. But I learned that that's a way of my dreams manifesting because most of the times I don't remember when I wake up or I will have a feeling about it. Or if it's a particular person that I'm worried about, I just wake up like I need to call this person. And I know already something I dream, but I don't necessarily remember clearly. Uh, I try to be more disciplined about it, but to be honest, I let it go with the flow. So Exactly. And it always comes back to you, I'm sure. It comes. It always comes. Many times on the runs actually comes <laughs> So you talked about your aha moments. Are there any other aha moments that you want to share with the audience? Well, I guess in dentistry, every time, and this is going to be so silly and so prostrantist, but every time I take a final impression, I have an aha moment. I feel like everybody has like a skill. And if I could pinpoint one humbly, it will be for me final impression. It's something that I enjoy. It's one of the procedures I love and doing, enjoy, and I feel it's a challenge every time. So every impression is challenging for a reason, either because of the patient's alive or whatever, the two, the margins, anything. So I always feel challenged for the procedure. And every time I do it and I take the impression of them out and I see it, all the margins, I had that moment of feeling, this is exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's just a, that little cool air on my heart, on my brain. So, Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. It's nerd. I know. A little bit nerd. <laughs> No, I think it's fabulous. Tell me, is yoga your way to manage stress? And how did you come to love yoga so much? I started doing yoga in Venezuela. I have a friend that was in dental school with me that she dropped dental school to become a yoga teacher. So it was her call and she still do it now. Basically, she started coming to my house and started teaching me as she was learning. So I became her first student, which helped me, I guess, grow and learn yoga with her. Of course, in dental school, I feel it was a way of just stretching and, and compensating for the bad postures we have and all this. But I started getting more in depth into knowing what yoga was about and what other benefits can you get from the meditation perspective too and to involve it with other practices. So later, I came here, started practicing yoga. It was a challenge because I learned yoga in Spanish. So I had to learn all the postures and everything now in English. So it was a learning curve. But I always had that in, in mind of doing a teacher training just to deepen my practice. I feel along with that, I, at, for a while, I carry a meditation practice. Now I don't have a still meditation practice. I have more like a running meditation. So when I need a meditation, when I'm having a hard day, when I'm like my mind is not in the right place, I go for a run. Yeah. And no music, nothing, just to clear my mind and to feel like I'm connected with each foot that touches the floor. So I actually focus on the sensations of the feet inside the shoes and the shoes on the ground and so on. So it, it's very powerful. I feel like all human beings need a connection with their body, a way of channel emotions and energy that are not meant to be in, within the human body that we bring to our environment because the way we live. And they know that in their culture a lot better than us. They do it a lot better because they have this as part of their daily practice. But I found myself doing yoga the most when I'm more stressed and in the winter. Those are things that I, two things that I found that my body craves more for yoga when physically outside environment is cold or when emotions and all that are cold. Those I definitely channel through yoga. The opposite spectrum is when summer or when I'm in a good mood, energized ideas, that's running. So I go with seasons and I learn that that's okay. But for a long time, I used to have a schedule. I'm like, I have to do yoga three times a week and then running. Ta -ta 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 -ta. So, and of course, it will never work that way because it's, you just have to give your body what it needs at that particular moment and what your calendar says that you should be doing. So accepting that and learning to listen to my body, to what it needs, it allowed me or for me the, the beautiful gift of understanding how related my body is with the moments that are happening, the emotions that I'm feeling and the seasons. So I always said like I go like six months heavy into running and then six months heavy into yoga. Sometimes I overlap a little bit because one thing helps the other. 
but for the most part, it's either one or the other. What's your ideal run? How many miles? I've done a couple of half marathons. That was, I think, of my bucket list too. Now I just probably run on the weekends, maybe 10, 15 kilometers, which might be like 10 miles here and there. On the daily basis, I try two, three times a, a week to do five to seven kilometers. Just It really depends on the things that I'm dealing with. Mm-hmm. More or less, sometimes I need more, sometimes I don't need anything. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a personal motto or a phrase that you live by? Yes, if I heard this once and it really impacted me and I still carry on today. And I guess it, because I'm a strong advocate for family and I'm a very family-oriented person, it said, the, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with your family. And I don't remember who said it, but of course I read it probably in some book. And that really resonated with me because it goes linked to the piano, piano, si valentano. The small steps, the, the little things, and many times, how many times in life we feel we're stopped by others. Oh, if I didn't have this. Oh, if uh, I see it with my, even me, myself and my friends that they have kids and they feel like they have all different, they wear so many different hats in life that I can't even imagine how they do it. But if it really turns down to where do you want to go? How fast do you want to get there? And what is the value of getting there fast? You're going to get there fast and then what's next? Versus you want to go really to places that could transform you if you go together. And I think the family concept could be extrapolated to any working team. I tell my team all the time, we're a team, we're a family. If we're a family, we go together, period. If we don't go together, we're not a family. <laughs> like uh, it's- Well, and... That's how we feel at Tufts, right? Tufts family. You know, we're jumbo strong, jumbo family, and that's just the bottom line. It's part of who we are and what makes working at Tufts so, you know, wonderful is is the family pride that we all have, I think. That's great. I think that that might be an African proverb or something. I, I remember seeing that one as well. Either that or it's Nelson Mandela. I can't remember exactly who said it, but I do. I've heard that quote, and it's a it's a great one. It's a really great one. Do you have a secret dream or you know a, a desire that you want to accomplish in your life? I want to be a mom. Ah, that is something that if, if I could call it a dream, the time hasn't come yet, and uh, now that I search for it, I feel like I live other moments in my life. As I said at the beginning, I'm kind of slow for most things compared with others. But that's something that I feel it will make me completely fulfill my mission of give to take it to another level. So that's something that I look forward to in the future if I have the opportunity. If I don't have the opportunity of have children on my own, I will be adopting. I have no problem. I feel there's so many kids in the world that need the love. Yeah. So that could be one. I have a good, a dear, dear friend whose podcast actually was on and Unfortunately, she lost her husband and went to the Soviet Union or the USSR, what, you know, Soviet Union, I guess, and adopted a son. And he's now 12, I think, or 13. And it's just a, a great story. You know, she, she wasn't able to have any children with her husband. So she just decided that, you know, this was something, a lifelong dream that I've always had that, I, you know, I wanted to be a mom. So it can be done. And she's a single mom raising her son. And, you know, yeah, if it doesn't happen, go for it. You've got a whole family around you that will help support you for sure. I have no doubt. I have no doubt. And that's exactly what she's done is just created this great support system around her. So which is fundamental, whether you have children or your, of your own or not. I think the support system, it helps you, helps the children too. So it's a beautiful thing to have. Absolutely. I will tell you, it, was, it has been my proudest moment is being a mom. And I didn't think I would ever love my grandchildren as much as I love my daughter. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, you wonder where you find this love because you can't imagine loving another human being as much as you love your own children. But I have to just tell you, my life lights up when I see my grandson and I'm expecting, my daughter's expecting again in November. And so, and she's having a little girl. So, you know, now she'll have one of each and I just am so excited, just beside myself with excitement. So what a gift, the the real gift of life. Yeah. 
So our time has come to an end, uh, Gabriella. I'm so sorry to say we have, um, you know, to call it a day, but I am so excited that you were able to share your story with the audience and your upcoming podcast. We can't wait to start listening to it. And I wish you all the success in the world and getting it launched and getting it out there. And if by any chance I can help promote you, please let me know, because I think that that's the one thing that I hope our community understands that, you know, even when others don't want to collaborate, I think, you know, the best thing we can do is support one another and collaborate with one another and cheer each other on because, you know, that's what we should be doing. So please let me know. And I'm happy to support you and cheer you on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, for for this opportunity to share my story. And I really hope it can inspire others to go without fear and conquer life. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Thank you so much for listening to the Women in Dentistry podcast with Dr. MJ Hanlon. If you like our show and want to know more about us, check out our website, thewomenindentistry.com or please leave us a review on iTunes. Join us for our next episode as we bring you another amazing woman leading the way for the next generation.